Hello everyone, this is the second lecture on the basics of uh, circuit analysis. Uh, like I said, this is a very important lecture uh, that I had to break it into two parts. You've already watched the first part of this lecture and I'm going to continue uh, with the second part. So we uh, first defined uh, a new concept. We called it the resistance of the material. And the resistance by definition was the potential difference across a component divided by the electrical current that is passing through it. And uh, we had to make that uh, uh, definition in order for me to explain uh, some of the assumptions that we're going to use in a network like this. An electrical network is a basically useful uh, network of uh, electrical components that are connected to each other in a certain way so that they do a useful work for us. And the connections were done through uh, wires with very low resistance. And the resistance is low enough, we mentioned, uh, that we can actually assume that relative to the re resistances of the components, we can ignore that resistance and assume that it, the resistance is almost zero. The reason that was important was that if the resistance of a piece of wire is zero, then by this definition, if this ratio is equal to zero, that means that the voltage across is equal to zero. And therefore, if I want to define voltage or potentials for each one of these, the potential on here and the potential on this point are going to be the same. And then we said, therefore, I'm going to call this the same node. So these are the four nodes in this simple electrical network. OK, so uh, just to quickly uh, uh, basically recap, we, what we are trying to do is to take this electrical network, which is a network of electrical components connected to each other with uh, wires, and calculate all the voltages across and the currents going through the components. Now, to do so, I'm going to do, I'm going to introduce a, a, a very general algorithm. If you follow this algorithm a step by step, you will not have any problem analyzing any circuit, uh, regardless of what, how complicated that circuit is and what components are in that circuit. This is a very general approach to circuit analysis. So listen carefully. Uh, the process, I break it down into three steps. So first, and sometimes I actually think this is the most important step, you're going to label the circuit. OK, so what do I mean by labeling the circuit? What I mean by labeling the circuit is that you have to identify nodes, label node voltages, and label component currents. So let's start from the beginning. Identify the nodes. I guess we already did that. Nodes are terminals, connections to the components. So for each component, there are terminals where you electrically connect to them. Each terminal is basically a node. Now, we mentioned that if the nodes are connected through pieces of wire, then we can actually unify those and call them the same node. OK? So, we have already done this. We have identified the nodes for this circuit. Then we're going to label nodes with uh, basically call them and give them, assign them a potential, electrical potential, and an unknown electrical potential at this point, right? We don't know what the electrical potential is. We're just going to label it so that we can later on uh, do uh, analysis and calculate those. And we start by saying, OK, um, this is V1. 
this is V2, this is V3, and this is V4. Let me actually, it appears that these are not showing up in my video. So this is V2, and this is V3. Okay, so with this, I have labeled the voltages. Now, uh, I need to define currents that are passing through the components. Now, the number of currents that are passing through the components are equal to the number of components in a circuit. So in this case, we have one, two, three, four, five components, and therefore there are five currents that are passing through. Which direction the current is going is completely arbitrary. At this point, we don't know what the actual direction of the current is, so we're going to just make an assumption, say this is I1, that's I2, this is I3. Actually, I'm going to use the name of the component for the current that's a bit easier. So IA, IB, IC, ID, and IB. One thing that I want to make sure you're actually paying attention to is that I define the current for the component and not for any other part of the circuit. So the currents are defined as passing through a specific component. So we have uh, currents that are equal, that are uh, passing through components and then voltages that are assigned to the nodes. So you agree with me at this point that if I am able to calculate all the voltages that I've labeled and all the currents that I labeled, then I can simply take the difference of the voltage across, multiply by the current that is passing through, and calculate power for all the components in the circuit, which is the ultimate goal. There's nothing beyond that that I need to know about the circuit, and I've accomplished my goal. Okay, so now from this point on, my mission becomes how to calculate all these the voltages and currents. So, one thing that we have to add here is that if this is the approach that you're, you're taking, then one more thing in this step that you need to do is to identify one of these nodes as your reference. And you have to do this because voltage or uh, potential is a differential concept. You can calculate the, dif the voltage difference differences for all of these components uh, Basically, you can calculate the voltage at one end with respect to the other end, but in order to have a value for each one, you have to have a reference, meaning that if you want to calculate all the voltages with respect to, for each node, one of these nodes need to be assumed as your reference uh, and the point where all the other voltages are going to be uh, ref referenced to. So, and that's a completely arbitrary choice. You can take any of these and assume that the, the potential of that node is equal to zero. So in this case, I'm going to assume it's the V4 that is equal to zero. Now, sometimes, actually a lot of times, that's shown by putting a symbol like that next to the node that is assumed the reference potential in your circuit, and that's called the ground and this is really, I guess, it with re reference to uh, how in, gravita in gravitational potential, ground is the lowest gravitational potential. So if this is ground, that's the lowest gravitational potential. And as you go up, the gravitational potential increases. So, and uh, actually, the other likely reason is that sometimes this reference is the Earth. So this is connected to an uh, to actual Earth. Uh, but that's not necessarily true. So you can just simply assume any reference without any actual electrical connection to Earth and call that a ground zero for you for that potential. Okay, now once I make that assignment, then I'm all set and I can start uh, doing my uh, process of circuit analysis. Okay, so the next step uh, is something that we ha I'm going to write it down and then explain to you what I mean by this.
So we're going to write Kirchhoff's current law and equations for all the components in the circuit. This is the next step that we're going to do. Now, you need to know what Kirchhoff current law and equations for the components are and what do I mean by that. So let's uh, discuss that. Kirchhoff's current law. So if you take a node, right, and assume that there are connections to this node, and through these connections, there are currents coming in and currents leaving. What is current? Current is passage of charge carriers through a cross section. In other words, electrons coming in to that node and electrons leaving that node. Now, our assumption is that inside that node, there is no reservoir for currents. There is no way for the currents to be sunk out of that node, or there is no way for the electrons or charge carriers to be generated inside that node. And if that's the case, if one electron enters this node, then that same electron has to leave the node. There's no place for it to be sunk out other than these connections, and there is no way for it to be generated out of thin air. So one electron comes in, one electron leaves. So I, with that, it's intuitive to understand that I can assume all the currents in have to be equal to all the currents out. Any electron coming in is equal to the electron going out. And this is the Kirchhoff, Kirchhoff's current law. You should not really try to memorize this. This is a very intuitive concept. If you take a note, all the currents that are coming in are electrons that are moving in and out. So therefore, one electron comes in, one electron leaves. Therefore, all, if you add all the currents that are going in, that has to be equal to the, all the currents that are leaving the node because none of those electrons can be sunk out of that node through any other means, and you can't generate electrons within that node. So very intuitive description and uh, should not require you to memorize anything. So that's Kirchhoff's current law. So what is the equations for the components? Okay. So let me actually, because that one is quite um, uh, widely used. I don't have to tell you what that is, but this one is kind of my own note, uh, notation. So I'm going to have to write it. Equations, equations for components. So what do I mean by that? So each one of these components have a potential across and a current that is passing through it. Now these devices, uh, depending on what they are, there is a physics that defines the functionality of that component. And out of that physics comes an equation that relates the voltage difference or potential difference across the component to the current that is passing through it or in other words, defines, generally speaking, how this component behaves with respect to the voltages across and the currents that it is, that is passing through it. We take those components one by one and write down what those equations are. So the two steps are now known. For the first step, I go node by node and write the Kirchhoff's current law for each one of the nodes. And then for the second step, I go component by component and write down what is the equation that defines the operation of that component. Once I do that, there's nothing more to be known about that circuit. This is it. This is all that we need to know about that circuit. And the only thing that is left is math. In other words, once you're done, out of these two steps, you get a set of equations. And you can 
take that set of equations, a solvable set of equations. You can take that set of equations, use math, and then calculate all the unknowns in that. Now, for this circuit, all the unknowns, once you write all these equations, would be V1, V2, V3, IA, IB, IC, ID, and IE. And doing math, you can actually calculate all the values. Now, the beauty of this technique is that it's universal. As you can tell, this technique is independent of what these components are, how they're connected to each other, um, and you can make it as complicated or as simple as you want and repeat the same three steps and always analyze this circuit. Uh, at this point I want to point out to you that circuit analysis could be done by uh, computers at this, uh, at this age. Uh, really, uh, after you graduate, unless you're doing a very simple circuit, you will, you will not do circuit analysis with hands. You will uh, put it in a circuit anal uh, analysis software and the software is going to take care of it. So therefore, if a computer can do circuit analysis, what that means to you is that there is an algorithm. There's an algorithm that could be followed because computers don't think, right? They just follow steps of an algorithm. And that algorithm is what I wrote to you here. This is the algorithm that is followed by uh, any circuit analysis software in order to give you all the values there is uh, in terms of the voltages and currents of the circuit. So circuit analysis, this is it. We are basically uh, able to do uh, any circuit analysis from this point on just following the, these uh, three steps. It's, uh, it's extremely simple in terms of the mechanics of it. In terms of the implementation, uh, you have to practice. You have to practice a whole lot in order to be able to actually follow these steps. And we're going to do that into, in the face-to-face -face, uh, classes that uh, we have throughout this semester. And you bring in examples, and I'm going to assign homeworks, and we're going to practice a few uh, in these online lectures too. Um, obviously, there is uh, into in, in, in this step when you want to actually do it, KCL and writing equations for components. Y you basically need to practice writing KCL to make sure that you know how to do that. And the equations for components, uh, you have to one by one. We have to introduce components one by one and explain what the equation for that component is before you can actually write it for on your own. Uh, but generally speaking, in all the quizzes and exams that I'm going to uh, uh, do through in, in the semester, I give you the, the equations for components, even if they're simple, uh, uh, if you don't know them, uh, you can ask for it and I'll give them to you. So you don't have to memorize any of the equations for components, although if you practice enough, you can you will uh, uh, naturally rem remember some hopefully all by the end of the semester but no need to actually uh, beat yourself to remember uh, these equations at all you don't really need to memorize anything in this course the, the part of this process that uh, has been proven to me to create the, the most difficulty for a lot of students is actually laboring the circuit how to identify the nodes, how to call all the voltages and pick your uh, ground or zero reference, and then how to label all the component currents, turns out to be what a lot of students are going to have difficulty with, uh, which, is, uh, uh, which, is, which is kind of counterintuitive. Um, and then, at the end, I have to mention that math is not uh, a favorite subject for a lot of engineers generally speaking. Um, so if in your any of your exams you do the labeling correctly and you write the equations correctly, I'm actually going to give you 80% of the credit. And whether or not you can do the math that only has 20% of the credit. So without doing any of the math, you should be able still to get a, a B. Now, for the math, um, I'm going to uh, 
explain to you how to solve a uh, uh, linear set of equations in a different lecture. Uh, but you can also use your calculators. I don't mind if you use a calculator to do the math. Uh, you have to learn how to enter sets of equations into your calculator and then do the math that way. Uh, you can also obviously do that uh, by hand. Um, you know, sometimes that gets complicated, but if you practice, you can actually master that too. And I, uh, and I usually do that myself because that's like uh, training your brain and it's not a bad idea. Uh, so uh, at least make sure that you can do those two things if you don't have a calculator. And then if you have a calculator, the math should be just a matter of punching in all the equations into your calculator. Okay, so that said, let's start doing uh, a simple circuitry here instead of this. We can start doing like simple circuit to practice this. Let's say I have a battery. That simple circuit that we have used a couple of times and then connect that to a light bulb. Okay. So, let's say this is a 1.5 volts battery and that's a 1.5 volt light bulb. Now, let's imagine that the resistance of this light bulb, first of all, the light bulb can't be, so if I want to now symbolize this, I can actually, this is a sign that is sometimes used for a battery or a symbol. And for the light bulb, I can simply use a resistor. So the functionality of the lump light bulb can uh, be resembled by just the simple resistor which is the resistance of this element that is inside the light bulb and this is a battery a symbol that is used or a DC or constant source of uh, voltage which is 1.5 volts very simple circuit okay so let's see how we analyze this circuit we're gonna go through this I'm sure you've seen a circuit like this before I'm sure you exactly know how to do it without following any of these three steps but I want you to actually follow these steps so that you see that whatever you're doing is a result of what's here uh, the only difference is that most likely you're skipping steps and although for a simple circuit like this you can skip steps without any problem most likely the trouble is if I make this uh, circuit is uh, different than what you have seen before then you may not be able to do it using all the equations or tricks that you know. Whereas if you follow these steps, you can always make sure that you can do the analysis. So we said we're going to identify the nodes. That's the first thing that we do. So these two are connected with a piece of wire. That's one node, and these two are connected. Another piece of wire, another node. And then off of that, I'm going to start labeling. Uh, there are two nodes. Uh, I'm going to take one as my ground, so that's my zero volts, and then the other one I'm just going to call it V1, that's V1 potential. I have two components, so I'm going to say there's a current I1 here, and there's a current I2 there. So now I have labeled my, my circuit with all the voltage, no, like potentials for the nodes and the currents passing through the components. Okay. So now I have to start writing KCL. KCL is written for nodes. So I'm going to say KCL. How many nodes do I have? I have two nodes. In that node, there's a current going in, which is called I1. That's what I called it. And there's a current going out. It's I1 going into that node. I, I2 is going out of that node. And we said KCL mandates the two currents to be equal to each other. How about this other node? Again, there's a current going in, it's I2, and there's a current going out, I1. So this is interesting. It shows 
that these two equations, although I wrote them for two different nodes, they're actually consistent. In both cases, it says I1 is equal to I2. Well, so be it. What this means is that mathematically speaking, I did not need to write the KCL for both. Just writing one has the information that is given to me by the other one. So generally speaking, if you have a node where you define the voltage of that node as your ground, you don't have to write the KCL for that node because the information for that node is already uh, given in other KCL equations that you have. Then equations for components. So how many components do we have? One, two. Now, I, at this point, I have to tell you what the equation for these components are. For a constant voltage source, and I'm going to generalize that, and we're going to go back to this and do a lot more of this, explaining how, what these equations are. But this is what it is. If the uh, source... The equation for a source like that, which is the same thing as we have over there, is that the, the higher potential minus the lower potential is the potential of the positive minus the potential of the negative is equal to the voltage that is given for the source. So in this case, it means that V1 minus 0 is equal to 1.5 volts. That is the equation for that component. Okay? component being a constant source of voltage. The resistor. What's the equation for the resistor? The resistance had a definition, if you recall, and that actually defines the physics of that component and is the equation for that component. We also called it the Ohm law. So what that was, was that you take the voltage or potential of the higher or the potential of the end where the current is coming from and subtract it from the potential of the other end where the current is going out of and then divide that by the current that is passing through and it gives you the resistance. That was the definition of resistance. So you can just manipulate that slightly and say the equation for that component is I2, the current that is passing through it, is the voltage difference across it defined it by the known resistance of that light bulb. Okay? So if I give this a value and say this is 10 ohm, the unit of resistance, this becomes V1 minus 0 divided by 10. So now I can calculate this. This says I1 is equal to I2, V1 is equal to 1.5. So I2, and now I'm doing the math. I2 is equal to 1.5 divided by 10, which is 0.15 amp. And this is actually equal to I1. So I know what I1 is, I know what I2 is, and I know what V1 is. And I'm done. So V1 is 1.5 volts. The current that is passing through the resistor, the light bulb, is 0.15 and the current that is passing through the uh, battery is also 0.15. So everything about that circuit is now known. This was just an example of uh, implementation of this simple algorithm that I discussed. We're going to do a lot more of this uh, until the end of this semester. Thank you.